Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam. Uh, today I just came from the Moksu and I had to come and do this thing. So uh, have mercy on me. Uh -huh. So today I've appeared in my proper regalia. Then you can see and know me. Right. So guys, um, thank you very much for the support so far. And I'm happy uh, many of you are enjoying the slides and are um, taking this um, uh, quite well, adopting quite well. It's a very good one because there's all we have left. <clears throat> and so we just have to make good use of it. And so, guys, um, we'll see how best we can make it helpful for you. And as usual, do well to comment and give your um, thoughts so that we can improve and serve you better. After all, that's why we're here. Anna. So, um, a few notices to use before we go into the lecture. Um, yes, still some of you are not watching the videos and um, answering the questions. But it's to your own advantage. The good news, <laughs> as to however you take it, is that the University of Ghana has given us instructions to the effect that owing to the COVID-19, as you well know, the academic calendar <clears throat> has been extended. Even more importantly, we have been served notice by the academic board that for this semester, things have changed. Your academic um, regulations have all changed. And so basically what is happening is that Continuous assessment is going to be 70% of your grading. And then the main exam would rather carry 30%. Mm. So it means that the many tests that we are taking, now you see, are going to be the basis for the 70% I have to account for you. And so those of you who have not been taking the assignments, both Socrative and Sakai, it is no fault of mine. Yes, it's no fault of mine. And so, again, <clears throat> a word to the wise is enough. At best, I will upload the questions and then you would have the pleasure to have to go and answer them as best as you can. Now, one of the things you don't know is that for the questions on Zakai, I rationalize them. I've been getting responses of people who I worked with this person and yeah, that person got all correct and I got all wrong and all of those things. Little did you know that your question one is that person's question three. <laughs> so you better listen to the lecture flow it quite well, then you're able to answer the questions. Last week, questions were over eight. The previous week was over five. This week, I'm going to upload a number of questions as well. So if you do it, fine, because I've not been getting over 500 responses. Meanwhile, this class is over 1,000. There's very little I can do about it if that turns out to be the norm. Again, know that next week, we won't have lectures on YouTube. Next week, we will upload the IA because we've not done the IA. So the IA is going to be on Sakai and the questions will be uploaded and open for you from 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. Next week, Thursday, 30th of April. Now, <clears throat> we are giving that length of time because number one, I'm going to put a limit to the questions that you can enter in only once. And so once you answer, that is all. And I'm even going to put a time limit on it, on the IE, so that when you answer within a number of hours or minutes, you should be done so that you can't be doing. No, no, no. no. So next week, take time to go through all the lectures from lesson one through to lesson 10, as I'm going to present today and then get yourself ready so that once you enter, you answer within the time frame, and you cannot do it again. But for those who have internet connectivity problem, that is why we are leaving you till 
the 10 p.m. And I am thinking that between 6 a.m. and 10 p.m., oh my, whatever connectivity problem you have must have been solved so that you can deal with the questions appropriately. In the light of those who have connectivity problem, I promise I won't put a time limit on it so that if you have connectivity problem, it will. But then what I can assure you is that you can only go in once. You can only go in once. Those of you are having problems with, I didn't save and all of those things. Well, this is I, I can't help it. So please try as much as possible and get involved, do it so that it will account for the 70% also that we are going to be doing and then again those of you who have not been attending tutorials well i'm taking attendance there also because as part of the 70 i'm going to award marks for participation so the at least for now we don't attend lecture and so i'm unable to measure your participation but one i can take your response on youtube as participation because on youtube i get to see who was there Yes. And then I can see your responses on Sakai as determinant of who was there. Then at tutorial, the teaching assistants are taking cognizance of who is at tutorial. And I mean, in terms of uh, your names that appear on the list, and then they will furnish us with it. And that is going to give you a whooping five marks for attendance. Open five marks if you know what one mark does <laughs> uh, so please I'm also a father and so I would want you to get an A and I'm, I'm actually hoping that all of you will get A's after all when you don't get a, when you don't pass I suffer I have to come and teach you again and mark again so please help me let's help ourselves study and make the right corrections thank you very much for listening now we go into the lecture and then we'll see. We have been having discussions, various discussions so far about Christianity as has been introduced. And um, we've been discussing how Christianity has come about and all the issues around it. Last week, we looked into Christian festivals and we have seen Christian practices. Now that we are ending our lecture series, and so this is lesson 10. Then there will be two more lectures and we'll be we'll set ourselves ready for exam. And so take it seriously. And so for today, we, we are now focusing on Ghana. We are now focusing on Ghana and we are looking at how Christianity has um, been uh, expressed in Ghana. So for today, we are going to focus on um, overview of Christianity in Ghana and largely we want to focus on the mainline churches, the historical mainline churches. And as you can see from um, the slide, the picture you have there is um, the Amina Castle. And you have the, Dan the Danish flag over there. Yeah, it's one of the places I cherish. After all, that was where I had my master. And so I enjoyed that place. Yeah. <laughs> right okay so that is it now what we are saying is that christianity ventured into ghana as a result first and foremost by portuguese explorers now these explorers in 1482 entered into ghana they were looking for trade routes and then they got to elmina now when they got to elmina they did all that they had to do. But then unfortunately, this missionary enterprise did not succeed for various reasons. Now, uh, however, around um, 1828, a more robust approach was adopted by some other missionary groups. And um, uh, we see that they altered the landscape of religious practices in the country. So that at that time when they ventured in, largely were traditional believers. Let me say that even before this time, Christianity had entered into Northern Africa, African territories, which I think we've mentioned in the earlier lectures when we were in school. And so, um, but in West Africa, Christianity had not ventured here. 
but then um, the Portuguese explorers got here and because when they came, usually when they come, they come practicing their religion. They also came along their religion because they had chaplains on the boat who would minister to their spiritual needs. And indeed, they were Catholic Christians. And so uh, the administration of the Eucharist and many other things, you needed a priest to do that. Today, Christianity has become the religion that is subscribed to by many Ghanaians uh, for whatever reasons. Yes, for whatever reason. Now let's look at why the Portuguese mission came to Ghana. They came to Ghana to gain back lost lands to the Protestants. You know, around this time in the 15th century, the uh, Protestantism has entered into Europe and the church had broken. And so the Catholic faith, you see, and you know that the Protestants are very, very evangelical, while the Catholics, we hold on to uh, practices and many things. And so the um, uh, Protestants are taking over many of the Christian territories. To this effect, the Catholic uh, Pope, uh, Pope John II, I think, yeah, uh, decided that he would commission what you call um, a few Catholics to look for new lands. And so under the guiseship of uh, Prince Henry the Navigator, this group was set up led by Don Diego the Ajambuda to lead an expedition to look for lands. It was also in terms of increasing the membership of the church. We've said that the Catholic Church was losing a lot of members. And again, to look for lost colonies, to look for places to uh, take care of and also to, for trade and to explore and know how about the Dark Kingdom. The, the Europeans were not quite sure what was happening. <laughs> Now, parts of the world, and so they largely uh, wanted to explore and see what happened. So, as you can see, these missionaries who came were actually no missionaries, they were explorers. They were explorers, they were just but looking for. Uh -huh. in, in essence, after these explorers came and uh, they failed. There were two other waves, as we described, but that is not important to us. But for now, let us go into some of the challenges that the missionaries faced. One of them was their interest in trade rather than mission. Like I've mentioned, when they came, the attention was rather on trade than mission. So they did not really come as, um, men can I say, <laughs> so there was largely um, no, uh, they were not trained evangelists. Many of them were not trained evangelists. Many of them were not trained missionaries. They were rather explorers. They were rather marketers, merchants. But usually when they come, they had the, um, uh, what do you call, priests with them as chaplains. Uh -huh. And then also, the other problem they had was morality. You see, the Africans had a bit of challenge with regard to a distinction between the... <laughs> so, indeed, you can't distinguish between the missionary from the merchant. And missionaries, uh, sometimes, and even with the merchants, because of this sexual promiscuity, because they had left Europe, they had come here, and then they sleep with our women here. Uh -huh. And so uh, the indigents were like, look, you guys, you are, you are preaching a new religion. Where is the place of morality? When you are sleeping with our children without marrying them. Uh -huh. So uh, a bit of moral issues were there. And then there was a question of health. Many of the missionaries who came died. You know, Africa was described as the white man grave. They could not sustain malaria parasite. They also had some financial challenges, yeah, in many ways. And then again, there was a problem of language. You know, we could not speak their language. They could not speak our language. So how do they interact? That was really an issue. Again, when they came, the activities were marked by mass conversion. So people, you see, like these days it happens. Yeah, 
Mama, I can cry. They are sharing. Sometimes last time I I responded to a certain crusade, and then when we finished, they gave us packs of food. So the next day I went again. Unfortunately, they caught me. <laughs> so you see, well, but the mass conversion people just gave their life without really knowing what they were giving their lives for, and so it became a problem. And um, again, the relationship between the missionaries and the colonizers. You see, the missionaries were white, and the Colonial masters were also white, and the colonial masters were putting a lot of pressure, were manhandling the indigent. Inti, they would not certainly, your, and your the, your enemy friend is certainly your enemy. The missionaries were friends to the colonizers, and so uh, they are enemies, and so whatever they said would not be accepted. In view of the failure of um, the missionary venture, and uh, largely because of the largely because of the let me say um health conditioning one man of the uh, society for the propagation of the gospel henry venn proposed a theory which is called the three cells what he advanced was that for missionary work to be successful in africa three cells must be um, pursued. The first one is self-governing. That is to say that the local people should have their own leaders to govern themselves and not to be detected to by the missionaries. You see, the churches were planted, the missionaries were somewhere in Europe and in other places, but then they were ruling, they decided, they were the bishops and all of that. But Henry Venn says, no, let the local people have their local leaders, their local priests who lead them. The second is self-financing. That is to say that let the local people raise monies because we can't always bring money from Europe and other places to take care of them. And so let them plant farms. Let them engage in entrepreneurial activities. So they introduce farming and many other um artisanry so that they can use that as basis of raising funds in order to support the church because they could not bring money from elsewhere. Then there is a self-propagating. That is to say that the local people must adapt local strategies that will help them to win over, that will help them to, um, let us, as it were, make converts. So if we have to bring missionaries from uh, Europe and other places to come and do their missionary work because of language and because of health, they can't sustain it. But then when the local people rather train, <clears throat> local people are the people doing the evangelization, then uh, souls would be won. And so in some cases, they took some of uh, our people to Europe, train them, make them priests, and then send them back. Yeah. So one of such was uh, Philip Kweku. Philip Kweku, those of you who come from central region must have heard of Philip Kweku or seen a school closer to the castle. That's Philip Kweku Methodist School or something. No, Anglican school, yeah. When you go there, Philip Kweku was picked up in the company of three, of two other persons. One of them got mad. If you for if you for I'm feeling he got mad on the way. And so he couldn't. And then the other also contracted chicken pox and died. But Philip Kweku was the only one who survived. And so he came to Ghana. And when he came back to Ghana, one of the things that uh, Philip Kweku is noted for was the introduction of school uniforms. So uh, he started school uniforms as part of a uh, Christian dressing. Now, Christianity in Ghana in general, there are two main uh, divisions in terms of pluralist, pluralistic uh, aspect of Christianity. The first is inter-institutional pluralism. So when you take Christianity alone, you have inter. Inter to say there exists many different Christian groups and denominations. Hey, sometimes you lose count of them. Hey. <laughs> so uh, you have the Methodist, you have the Anglican, you have the Presbyterian, you have the Catholic, you have the God's Way International Church, you have the something something Miracle Church. Uh, sometimes churches even changing their names. Uh, initially, they were World Miracle Church, now they are Perez Church. Initially, they were uh, Yuk, something something Yuk Foundation, and now they are uh, what 
uh, oh, there are something, something. Eh? And so it's interesting. So there are too many different denominations and the, the, the differences amongst them are largely due to um, doctrine and also um, some beliefs and practices that they hold, which um, makes them quite different. And sometimes they are each other's throats. Sometimes when <laughs> you sit on the radio and some pastors are fighting, ah, what is there between Obini and Obofo? Now, Grandpa, <laughs> it's between Obini and Kennedy, Japan. <laughs> and then uh, between, ah, yeah, but it could be. Uh, his spiritual father is uh, that man, the one who only predicts about death. What is his name? Po? Oh, that man who predicted about the imam and then we went to do him a little shiji and then <laughs> he went back to apologize. Yeah. So, what is there? Hey. Mm -hmm. Anyway, well, and then we have intra. So, the one is inter and the other, the other is intra. Within the same group, for instance, if you take the Catholic Church, among Catholics, there is the, uh, what do they even call themselves? The renewal. Uh -huh. Renewal group, the charismatics renewals. And they are Catholics so So you always find them being problematic in the Catholic Church. It's interesting. Because sometimes, you know what? Um, those who belong to the charismatic renewals, they believe that they are more spiritual. And those who don't attend, they are not. And so after... We have had mass. Then that is when they will come and do their sha la 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 la. <laughs> so you see, sometimes within a particular church group, you will find various divisions, various groups. For instance, if you go to the Presbyterian church, they say they have YPG, and then they have a women's fellowship. They have men's fellowship. They have something, something. If you go to the Methodist, they even have a, they have Christ Settle Band. <laughs> wow. Uh, but I like their song. Then you see they'll be clapping. Uh, ah. <laughs> wow. So so we'll have the inter where within the same Christian group there are various denominations and intra where within let's say one church tradition you have various groups in the amongst them. Now, the Christian food can be divided into two, the historical mainline churches and the Pentecostal churches. For today, we are going to focus on the historical mainline churches. I hear somebody asking, what is the historical mainline churches? Yo, we are going to go and you will understand. Now, if you look at the picture on the left, that is uh, my church, the Holy Spirit Cathedral. Uh -huh. You see, it's a, that's a But if you look at the right, try a koso. <laughs> the, the, it's a picture of a Pentecostal church and there you see some singers, you see the way they are standing and the wash your jeans, what they are sorry hey, and you see somebody leading and another person soon soon not banned, soon to a sorry, you know, no burning sometimes when the spirit comes upon them, they do all kinds of things, so let's go into the historical mainline churches, the historical mainline churches are said to have been established as direct result of Western missionary effort from the 19th century. Christianity came as a separate brand of Christianity from Europe. Now, what we are saying is that around this period, we are talking about the missionary activities, especially from the second wave, where they came and then they planted various churches. They came with um, various categories to have impact on the African soil. Now, this category, the historical mainline churches are largely the Roman Catholic Church and the Protestant churches. So we're talking about the Methodist, Presby, Anglican, largely. The Baptist Church at some point are also included on this. The average Ghanaian calls this group Orthodox Church. Aha, uh -huh. I feel as well. So normally you want to call this group Orthodox Church. But they say we're a scholar. You can't say Orthodox Church because if you would remember, there's great schism that happened, divided the church into the Catholic and the Eastern Orthodox Church. So when you classify a huge group of churches as Orthodox Church here in Ghana, and unfortunately, the problem is not from you. In uh, When I was young, I think I read in class 3 or class 5 in one of the textbooks that there are two types of churches, the Orthodox Church and the Pentecostal Church. But that is not correct. Now... You are growing now. 
you are a scholar now you you are going to have a degree mm-hmm. for having studied introduction to christianity so you can't go around saying orthodox church orthodox church and then now one more school into sakrawadi use the right term it is historical main line church and we'll explain why it is called a historical main line church so you can't call that as you can't call us yes because because i'm a catholic <laughs> Hey, Mr. Jalibia. Okay, you can call them <laughs> uh, what do you call uh, Catholic uh, Orthodox Church, but then you can safely call them the historical mainline churches. Why are they called the historical mainline churches? They are called the historical mainline churches because they are mission churches planted by foreign missionaries from the 19th century, and many of the other churches have emerged from their activities. So what we are saying is that there are historical mainline churches largely for the sake of this lecture on two levels. Number one, because these churches were planted by foreign missionaries. And we are going to look at some of the foreign missionaries that planted these churches. Number two, because many of the Pentecostal churches, I mean, you know, Otabel was in one of these, uh, I think he was an Anglican, you know, um every one of them i mean talk about the charismatic churches the giants even including um the papa he the papa himself yeah <laughs> so even including the papa the, the he was i think he was he was he was either an anglican or a presbyterian i'm not so sure but he had come he had been made from these backgrounds and so um we're saying that that is the two reasons why they are called historical because they are 19th century churches planted in ghana mainline because many of the other um, pentecostal churches have emerged from them and that is why we call them historical mainline churches these churches were planted as a result of the second and third wave of the european expedition Right, so let's take the missionary groups. Um, we we'll begin with the Catholic mission, the Catholic mission. Now this mission, they were the first to launch missionary activity into Africa under the leadership of Don Diego de Ajambuja. I think I began uh, telling you about it when they got here. As soon as they arrived, they, put, they came with a statue of St. Anthony. St. Anthony. And so that is why those of you who come from Cape Coast, you've been hearing an Antona, an Antona. It was Saint, it was the statue of Saint Anthony that they did Nana Antona. Uh-huh. So it is uh, then they said the first mass here, and then from there, Christianity spread to other parts of the West African sub region. And then they came in very like in you knowing the Catholic Church, there are various societies. So they came in various like the Dominicans and all others came. Now, three major missionaries for me I, uh, uh, in the Catholic mission were Sir John Marshall, fa- uh, Father Augustine Moreau, and then Eugene Morat. These have contributed immensely to Catholicism in Ghana the planting and its influence. And so those of you who are Catholics, uh, you know, we have the Marshallants. Uh-huh. We have the Marshallants. And so uh, it is from the activities of James Marshall and then uh, Augustine Moreau and Eugene Morat have contributed a lot to the planting of the church in our part of the world. Now, the impact of Catholicism or the Catholic church by way of their strategy when they came in they use largely education. So many of the missionaries uh, use education. As they taught you, they they tried to convert you. They also built a lot of hospitals and health cares so that as a minister to the spiritual needs of the people, they also took care of their um, health concerns. And so, you know, we have the Bato Hospital and many other major hospitals set up by the Catholic Church. And in terms of education also, these have not just been any schools. Don't say almost a school, no, a pa Catholic school is the best. Pope Jones, yeah. Uh-huh. So that is how the uh, Catholics have impacted. That was what they did. Once you come to school and then you are being educated, then you go through 
some Christian activities as well. So from nursery schools right down to university, the Catholics have it even today. And then the missionaries were successful in their work of evangelization in Africa in the establishment of schools. And then one of the things that the Catholic mission did very well was to focus on traditional leaders. Now, the, the idea was that once they converted traditional leaders, their subjects will also be converted. And so they got into that frail. Now let's look at the Basel mission. The Basel mission um, was a Christian missionary society based in Switzerland. The mission was founded as the German Missionary Society in 15, 1815, and then it later changed its name to the Basel Evangelical Missionary Society. But eventually, it became the Basel Mission. Yeah. Now, some of the major missionaries that uh, we know in Ghana, uh, Andrew Rees and uh, Fritz Augustus Ramsey. So, you know, many churches have been named after them. Those of you who are Presbyterians and um, you see them around, their history is quite interesting. <laughs> uh, interestingly, um, about Andrew Rees, when he first came, he was he was, he came in the company of three other two other persons, and then they were um, uh, attacked by malaria. And just before uh, the two of them died, Andrew Rees was saved in a propon when the traditional priest uh, took care of him. <laughs> the traditional priest took care. And yes, today I heard that um, what do you call? There was even a traditional leader who also made donation to the COVID nineteen fund and uh, was distributing food and other things to people. Hey, then I was asking myself. <laughs> so some of you, what would you have done? Uh, <laughs> but yes, sir. You anyway, but that is fine. Um. They also we they also um as it were say combine until we also think about the the, the 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 country. Now the impact of the Basel mission on um evangelization, their strategy was actually a by way of uh, translation. So the Basel mission did a lot of translation, they translated part of the New Testament, they translated the Book of Prayer largely into Ga. Ga. They did a lot, they did a lot of translation in Ga and um how do you call it? Um Equapim. Ga and Equapim. You know that the Basel mission largely focused on uh, the Ebrique area and then the Ecropon areas because of the temperate uh, nature. Now a major strategy of the uh, Basel mission was agriculture agriculture and here them put on record that the Basel mission were the first to bring cocoa to ghana they were the first to bring cocoa to ghana the only thing was that the breed they brought was not um the variety was not consistent with our weather but um how do you call this guy um Tetequashi was working in one of their workshops you see as part of the evangelization strategy like I mentioned, owing to the Henry Venn strategy, they set up certain workshops so that people will come to work. And this was a blacksmith workshop. People will come to work, they will learn the trade. And as they they work they, they, during their break time and other time, they share the word of God with them so that they can become Christians. And so we see that at Sway. And so uh, when they brought the cocoa bean, Tetequashi saw it. So later when Tetequashi got to Fernando Po, because he had seen the bean before, then he took what he had over there and brought it to Ghana because he had seen one before. And fortunately, that breed was uh, uh, okay with our environment here. And that was why it was successful. So the Catholic, the Basel mission were the first to bring cocoa to Ghana. Hooray! Uh, <laughs> and then they, they also used a lot of health care. So they set up a lot of... Um, health centers, we know many of their health centers to cater for the sick and whilst they do that, they also minister the word of So these were the major strategies. Again, the educational strategy, as was mentioned, the Presbyterian Church or the Basel Mission uh, took charge of it. And so 
as you know, the Basel, the Basel mission planted a Presbyterian church. Later, the Jamaican Presbyterians took over, and that was why they are called the Presbyterian church. And so, Basel for no uh, yet to fall. <laughs> right, let's go to the Wesleyan mission. The Wesleyan mission were actually introduced at the instance of um, uh, an indigent, William de Graft. Apparently, William de Graft was uh, attending the castle school and then there was a problem and so he was sacked because of the class it's not necessary to go into what the problem was when he was sacked he sought for work at discov and at discov he saw um a, a, a ship owner who was going to uh london who are who was reading a bible and so he told him oh he has a group called the bible bank the Bible band, then that, but they don't have a Bible. So when he's coming, he should bring him a Bible. So when he went, he rather requested that a missionary comes with him. Uh huh. So that was how. So uh, Captain Potter, Captain Potter, went, and then when he was coming, he came with Joseph Downwell. And when Downwell came, I think after six months, he died. And then Wiggly came, Wiggly and his wife came, and then after they also died, and then. Thomas B. Freeman, um, no, Hellerup also came, Hellerup, Hellerup, sorry, I didn't put it on the slide, Hellerup also came before uh, Thomas B. Freeman, who was, who has an African, but his, uh, it is, he, as a result of the slave trade, then he became a Christian and all of that, so he was a black person, and when he came, he did a lot for the Methodists, that is why many of the Methodist chapels are named after either Dunwell or B. Freeman. Thomas B. Freeman, yeah. So that is uh, how they also came. In terms of their strategy, they also use education. Methodists for the <laughs> education, any of you, you will know them. Uh, no, I know. <laughs> so they set up schools and they got people involved. And then um, I think it was Mrs. Wingley who started the Wesley Girls in uh, his uh, apartment to train young girls and then later um it has become the wesley girls today and then uh, we know of infant supreme and all of that uh, set up by the wesleyan missions and all of that and then the wesleyan missions also use health agriculture and translation translating uh, many of the text into the local language and you know the methodists were largely in the Cape Coast area, so they translated much more into Fanti. And so it's interesting, many of their hymns, are, when it's in translation, they sing it in Fanti. So even if you go to my hometown in Kumasi, they sing Fanti. Yeah. <laughs> Let's look at the Bremen mission as the last, uh, um, what do you call, organization. <coughs> Sorry. The Bremen mission uh, started as Nordic, uh, Nordetsch Mission, which was founded in 1836 in Hamburg, and um, it concentrated it work on the settlement on those in Everland. And so we are talking about the EP and how they have also emerged. In 1851, Bremen Mission uh, has its seat in the, in the Bremen, and then, therefore, it is known in Africa as the Bremen Mission or Mission de Bremen. And they say a French, you know, more and more French in Russo. So, um, that is the Bremen Mission. Let's look at some of their impact. They have um, impacted on education, health, and they also uh, used education, education, health, and they also used educational strategy. They also use educational strategy, health, and then translation into the local language of the people so that they can um, uh, appreciate the text or the Christian faith. Now, in general, when we before we bring the lecture to a close, the contributions of the historical main line and main is spelled wrongly here in the heading, sorry mainline churches today as in the area of education we know that many of our educational institutions in ghana um are or they belong to the many of the historical mainline churches and so we can mention a lot of them 
by the churches. And then in terms of health, they have also helped very strongly in that area. And then in terms of the national discourse, you see that usually you, whenever something is happening, you have the Catholic um, Bishop Conference, you have the um, World Council of Churches, or in Ghana, there is the um, local council of churches in the villages, and then the, 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 there are those where they come together and then they respond to certain policy issues. And so, for instance, uh, when the comprehensive sexuality education came, you saw that the, especially the Catholic Bishop Conference, wrote seriously about it, and then the Christian Council of Ghana also wrote and spoke vehemently about it. And so um, they, they help a lot in national discourse in many ways. And then in terms of businesses, there are a lot of businesses, investment portfolios that are managed by many of these churches. They, 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 they contribute quite well. A good number of uh, our population belong to such churches. And so they also um, participate and they help build it. So the historical mainline churches have been very significant in the uh, missionary or the Christian enterprise in Ghana. So then, Bin Danyeshi, Uyi won, Uyi, Uyi nye, nye don, aha, mata, me, me nye yu, Uyi wa la don, but this one is clearer, so, Uyi wa nye don, aha, thank you all for having participated in the lecture. So, let me uh, come back again and remind you that next week we don't have to be on uh, YouTube to listen for a lecture. Once you have read and you have gotten yourself ready, go to Sakai and answer the IA. For today, there will still be a few questions on Sakai so that you can get your hands on it and then I can also use it to grade you. Remember again, that the continuous assessment has shifted now that one is 70 percent and then the exam is 30 percent so you better take serious what we are doing and what we have been doing if you didn't take it serious there's your cup of tea but at least for the uh, i um take part in it i'm not ready to tell you how much max is for the i no how much of the 70 is for the IA alone, but take it seriously, uh, you can be sure, and then uh, get your house, everything together so that we will um, try and do well. If you have any questions, please get to um, Mumuni and Albert and they are sure to answer. I'm, I've told you that I'm taking cognizance of your participation uh, at what you call uh, tutorials and other lectures. So don't play with it, but get serious. Again, let me use this opportunity to advise you that even though for those of you in Kumasi and Accra and uh, Kaswa and other places, the ban on uh, lockdown has been lifted. Please be careful. At least try and wear a nose mask so that you protect yourself if you have to go out. But if you don't have any business, please stay at home and learn. I need you alive. I need you to continue the 200, 300, and 400 in religion. So please, uh, study hard and don't be going out unnecessarily when it doesn't matter. And if there is anything that you may want to write to me, you can write to me uh, an email on kwekubwama at ugene.edu.gh. Kwekubwama, one word in small letters. Kwekubwama, one word in small letters dot ug dot edu dot gh and i'll try as much as possible to respond so please go to the work answer them and all the best take good care of yourself and uh, hope that we'll meet again on youtube next two weeks next two weeks take good care of yourself and alabama south and me